as I'm sure many of you know, See Me is Scotland's national programme to end mental health stigma and discrimination. And arts-based projects have always been a significant part of our volunteer-led work and our partnership working. Um, See Me have been a long-standing partner to SMAF, in the Scottish Mental Health Arts Festival, and we're de delighted to be joined by Andrew from SMAF, who we'll be hearing from a little bit later today. There's Andrew, waving. Um, so we always want to be really clear about the evidence base for the work that we're doing at CME. And we've always had an incredibly strong sense that arts are very, a very important and um, an impactful way to tackle mental health stigma and discrimination. But now we want to really understand better how and why that's the case. So in this session, we really want to get, um, share some of the key findings from our new newly created arts research paper, which my colleague Claire, so with Claire, will be sharing in a second. Um, which is looking very much, very particularly at tackling stigma and discrimination within audiences through arts-based projects. Then we'll also be hearing from artist and CME community champion, Abby Pirani. Give us a wave, Abby. There she is. Um, and then we'll also be hearing from Lisa Nichols, the creative director at In Motion Theatre Company. And um, is, there she is. Sorry, I didn't even give you a wave prompt there you are lisa um who we're partnering with on on um, some really exciting projects at the moment i first now want to hand over to my colleague claire thanks very much um let me just get this up and running one be a second Okay, I think I've been told I've got the only presentation of the day, so I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. <laughs> I can be back afterwards. <laughs> um, so yeah, so as, as Miff said, um, my name's Colin MacArthur. I'm the monitoring and research officer for CME. Um, so don't have an arts background, not an interesting topic to research, and very much excited to be along this project. Um, so what we looked at was we wanted to look at the evidence that was already out there and what we could um, what we could use to help us be more knowledgeable around how we can use the arts to challenge mental health stigma and as we've said as well the impact that it has on the audience. So this research came about for us as we were getting more of the social movement team we're getting more and more frequent requests from our volunteer bases about using the arts to create, um, using the arts to challenge stigma. So we set out to collect this evidence base to guide people through this process. We know that the arts can be used to challenge stigmatizing attitudes and behaviors associated with mental health. And this paper looked to explore different methods that can be used and what components of stigma, looking at knowledge, attitudes and behaviors that they could help to challenge. So first off, um, we want to take you through some of the key themes that we found from the literature that was already existing. Um, as we've already mentioned, we've got SMAF in Scotland, so we've got Mental Health Arts Festival, and we already had a lot of a lot of information about how that's gone through the years and um, other projects that have happened throughout Scotland. So these are the key themes that we picked out, and hopefully some of the things that we'd like to discuss with him. So when we're talking about the cre creation of art was our first one. So the key things that came out through this were that um, the art has to be created collaboratively with people with lived experience. And that's something it seemed to me that it's a strong message that we hold ourselves. It needs to focus on the narrative of the experience and the individual story and that generally mental health, generally focusing on mental health doesn't necessarily reduce stigma as much. We also found through the literature that art focused on recovery can help to reduce stigma, um, and that it's really important to create that shared meaning between the audience and the artist through the emotion. 
There is also one other thing that I think we'd like to discuss a little bit more fully later on is that the literature talks about um, the art having to be of high quality artistic production. Um, and we'd maybe like to explore that with you a little bit more to figure out what that, what that really means for us as artists um, and, and for the community in general. So the next one that we talked about um, that came out quite strongly was where the art is displayed. So this is very much talking about um, the fact that the art should be displayed in the place that you are looking to influence. Um, but it very much touched on the fact that we could think of art being displayed in very many different places than the normal um, gallery or festival. Or So they were talking about whether it was in a social sphere and um, that could be like a rural community or whether it is in like a microsphere where they're talking about um, hospitals or shopping centers and um, very different places to which we're able to um, target with maybe other types of activities. They also talked about it should be displayed in mainstream public services and social movements and the art should be open access or low cost to increase the public access to it. So next up we had the audience for the anti-stigma message. It was very much linked to um, the point above. But this was very much um, highlighted the fact that um, there's low engagement from um, what the literature said was um, the older people, people on lower incomes and ethnic minority communities. But it says unlike other anti-stigma work where um, I know if you often find that you're um, inviting the same people along to the same events and that these, uh, these groups of people already have a good knowledge. Um, but actually the arts can go beyond this um, as they're not confined as much to separate spaces that we have the opportunity to um, actually distribute it further. The next one we looked at was um, activities involved around the art event. So whether this was like pre-event, post-event. Um, so this included a number of different things throughout the literature that people had tried. Um, we looked at educational materials and signposting. One of them had artist biographies. Um, one even went as far as providing mental health awareness sessions for the artists. Um, and panel discussions and Q&A sessions, which have been used to contextualize the artwork. And finally, we looked at all this and um, how, how the studies that we were looking at had reported the impact on the audience. So very, very much the same throughout the papers, which was nice to see. So increasing, increasing understanding of mental health problems is the main one. Increasing the understanding of the ability of people with mental illness gave the audience a more optimistic and knowledge and more made them more optimistic and knowledgeable about recovery. Um, but there was also discussions in here around how do we support this change in the long term. So there's a couple of examples of some people had recorded and um, what they were doing and showed them um, again and again. And um, some people had created toolkits. But again, I think that's something that would be really interesting to talk about with you later, later in the groups. So since before this, um, we took out, we looked to do some primary research around it. Um, and we very much focused in on the creation of art, the methods used pre and post and the impact that this made on reducing the stigma held by the audience members. So in our primary research, um, we're very lucky to be able to work with Scottish um, Mental Health and Arts Film Festival um, in 2020. Sorry, doesn't have film anymore. Scottish Mental Health Arts Festival. Um, and we collected data from audience members through their annual evaluation. Um, we asked respondents if they could self-assess the impact that the art had had on themselves. And, and these are some of the findings we had from the research. So very much um, the initial one, which we, um, as it seemed, we are very happy that this came out on top and I think we would have been surprised if it didn't come out on top. 
that the artwork, which included the voices and stories of people with lived experience, had helped to increase the audience's knowledge and positively change their perceptions of others and of themselves. Additionally, when we were looking at Q and A's and discussions, these um, these were shown to help increase the knowledge. And when we were looking at a focus on recovery of the artwork, this this was helping people to think differently about their own mental health. And finally, when we looked at um, intended behaviour change or asking questions about intended behaviour change, this was most positively influenced by changing the attitudes. Of the, by changing the audience's perceptions of people with mental health problems. Therefore, I think our findings show or highlight that um, basically our what CME is social contact theory and how we really drive that through our programs. It's therefore one of the strongest met stronger methods again and be can be used to improve the three components of stigma through the arts. This was a wide approach that we took to look at what worked and I think the other presentations today will be looking at a more focused pieces of work, which I'm very excited to listen to. Um, and thanks for listening and I'm more than happy to take any questions through the chat function. I think we'll get them later on. Thank you so much, Claire. It's it's a really exciting piece of research. Um, and it's great to hear you um, speaking about it just there. And it really does kind of underpin everything that we're speaking about today. And I think, you know, it's, I'm sure that there's nothing in that that anybody here would be sort of wildly surprised to see, but it's so great to have a place that we can, we can bring all of that learning together. And then we can use it to inform all of the research that we do going forwards, our future evaluation and how we start to plan for future projects. Um, so it's um, an amazing checklist um, for us to consult and a great roadmap for, for taking us forward. So thank you so much, Claire. Um, as Claire suggested, um, we will um, try and squeeze in a space for questions just before we go into the breakout room. So maybe if it's okay, we'll hear from, I'm saying if it's okay, you're all muted. I've got so much power. Um, we'll hear from the other, um, um, yeah, you all seem like you're okay with it. I'm, we'll hear from the other, um, contributors um, and then maybe open up for a couple of questions and Lynn will be keeping a close eye on that if there if there is anything that that, that pops up um, while while people are speaking and if we if the questions are too hard or we don't get to them right now then as I say we will be gathering all of this all of this stuff together and um, we will be putting out a short report to you all afterwards so we'll be able to kind of get into anything that needs a bit more musing time um, later. Um, so just now the next person I would like to reintroduce you to is um, artist and senior volunteer Abby Parani who I think is going to speak a little bit more about her experience of, of creating art um, and, and why that is so important to her. So thank you Abby and I'll hand over to you just now. I'm, I'm going to read this from a screen because I'm not very good at speaking off the top of my head. Um, my name is Abby and I'm an artist and craftswoman. I've been a CME champion for several years and have used that platform to tell something of my own story and journey with mental health in order to open conversations with audiences. I've also worked with different groups of vulnerable adults, creating a therapeutic space to encourage them to explore things creatively through visual media. Looking back, I'd say now that as a distressed young person, making creative statements allowed me to claim space that was just mine, with little influence from the other young people and adults around me. It's difficult to emphasize the importance of this. It's about the external concrete image that has come from within me, not anyone else, and that those images can define me in a way nothing else can. It's about the freedom of choice, color, shape, mark making, whereas in other parts of life there are few or no perceived choices. 
It's about individuality, self-expression, detachment, because it's now separate from myself, and increasing confidence. Working with vulnerable adults, I've found many have trouble accepting that their work has value, that others may wish to see it, that it's worth keeping and or showing. Which brings up the question, does art need to be seen by an audience at all? And does the artist need to think about the audience while making the work? The answer is emphatically no to both. That doesn't mean never, just that there must always be a choice. Art, particularly therapeutic art, may just be for the person making it. It has a legitimate function for the artist, a way of working stuff out or expressing the impossible or intolerable. The process of making may be an end in itself. The need to live in the now when using art materials is very engaging and satisfying. The life of the artwork may be fleeting, or the artist may keep it for years for the messages they continue to see in it. Personally, I've never liked doing commissions, as for me, it requires the artist to keep the audience in mind throughout the process. I find that doesn't work, particularly from a mental health perspective. Undertaking commissions implies a loss of control over image and meaning and imposes an audience on the work. For people who use art therapeutically, that loss of control can defeat the whole point of the work. Being able to choose the images we make, being able to say, this is mine, may be a real turning point for the creator of the work. Also, creativity itself is a variable, not a constant. The need to be creative can vary from hour to hour, day to day. Trying to push the work forward can often end in spoiling it. Sometimes it's just better to wait for the right time. Other times people can be scared of what they've unleashed in themselves. Suddenly they have an external concrete self, maybe for the first time in their lives. This self-imposed restriction could also be self-stigma that they don't want to accept what they've created, what it shows them about themselves. It may seem worthless, just scribbles, further limiting them. Sometimes we create our own prison bars. Self-skip stigma needs no audience, although encouraging people to engage with an audience may alter their feelings about themselves. I worked with one group where one of the outcomes was to increase self-confidence. They were people already marginalised through perceived lack of ability, recognisable limitations physically and or mentally, and all lacking confidence. After working with them one to one once a week over more than two years, we had an exhibition of their work. Myself and the person running the project framed the works ranging from abstract dabbed paint to recognisable representational work which had taken months to achieve. The exhibition space was the art room, roughly three metres square in a multi-use building. It was advertised locally. So who came to see it? The artists themselves saw each other's work mostly for the first time. Carers, family and a few local people came. The emphasis was on allowing the artists to recognise their work did have a value outside their art sessions for its image, mark making and effort involved. Several of them walked taller. Some were initially embarrassed then pleased with themselves and their achievements. An audience can be just the people we know who will acknowledge our work, knowing us they recognise and appreciate what we have done and how far we have come. To give another more recent and personal example, I was creating a puppet show about ACEs over three years, supported by See Me, among others. We were rehearsing for SMAF 2020 in March this year. The last rehearsal was 11 days before lockdown. I was there with my co-puppeteer and teacher, and of course, the puppets. 
The audience was two people. My facilitator director, who was giving her time to the project, mainly with emails and one-to-one -one meetings, and had come specially for this rehearsal. The other person in the audience was Maeve, who had supported the project since I first came up with the idea. The rehearsal went very well, and the audience gave valuable advice and support. Looking back from now, this October, I will never forget that performance. It doesn't matter that we will never put on that particular show. That day was the culmination of years of work. Each person there was special in my life and nothing will change that. So do we need audiences of strangers to tackle mental health stigma and discrimination? Yes, sometimes we do. We need skeptical people to be persuaded that these are genuinely our experiences and that things can change. We need supportive people to continuing, continue encouraging and advocating on our behalf. We need audiences to open up conversations, sometimes difficult conversations about the impact of our experiences. As creators, we also need to see other people's work, recognizing how differently they portray what may be a similar experience. A specific exhibition that does this really well is Out of Sight, Out of Mind, arranged by CAPS Advocacy Edinburgh. The variety of powerful imagery tackling stigma and discrimination experienced by a wide range of people was almost overwhelming. That so many had such powerful messages and experiences to share was a tribute to how far things have come. I think it's worth encouraging people to consider having an audience, although that can just be a few people they know or a room full of strangers, to continue challenging the stigma and discrimination experienced by those with lived mental health experiences, audiences are needed to spread the word and create conversations. Perhaps, most importantly, we, all of us, need to be heard acknowledged and witnessed. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Abby. That was absolutely wonderful. Um, I appreciate so much that you've come to a Zoom meeting that you absolutely cannot stand the format of um, to share that. Um, it was so powerful and it was so lovely to hear you describing the performance of um, Trace because I have such powerful memories of it as well and um, it will stay with me forever as well as being in that tiny audience. Um, it was a wonderful experience. Um, I think you've really touched on so many things that are so important in this overall discussion and all of the work that we want to do. Um, I will share that the reason Abby got involved in this event is because I was describing to her that we were doing a piece of work about connecting art and audiences. And she said, forget about audiences, <laughs> audiences don't matter. And I said, I think I need you to come and speak at this. Um, Obviously, Abby's um, passion for creating art therapeutic, uh, creating a therapeutic art is, is um, very evident. But also, I think it's really important um, to consider those different audiences for different types of projects, different types of artwork. Um, I think we, well, I'm going to say me, um, I can get stuck into thinking um, of an audience in a certain way that um, is sitting on, you know, well, in a room, which is obviously not something that we now can really do, but, um, you know, sitting in an art space on plush seats. Um, and that is not what an audience necessarily is um, for the type of artwork that we're, that we're describing. So um, I think that's a really important thing to, to hold in our minds. And also when we're talking about tackling stigma through artwork, then tackling self-stigma is is obviously an absolutely huge part um, of what can be achieved through the creation of art with with mental health themes so thank you so much 
thank you so much, Abby. Um, so next, um, I would like to um, reintroduce Lisa Nickel from In Motion Theatre Company, who I think um, some of what Lisa's going to share will will overlap with some of the with some of the um, themes that Abby has raised, and then obviously Lisa will have her own perspective on on the project that she's involved with as well. So thank you, Lisa. Great, thanks, me. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, I'm sometimes aware that sometimes, you know, you start and then the microphones are kind of cutting off and things like that. So I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about a little bit of background of why and what inspired me to get involved in writing work about how we can get rid of stigma about so many different things that happen in life that are all actually then related to mental health and why people don't want to talk about them. Um, a bit of experience about organisations I've worked with just really briefly to give you a kind of rounded picture um, and then the project that um, we are currently doing with CME when we did just previously and a current one just now as well um, but the main thing is um, my first play was called Acceptance that I wrote I work as a playwright a producer and an actress and um, when I wrote my play Acceptance it was about a girl who was trying to find her way in the world and uh, she went out and she was drinking to try and fit in but the actual thing was it was because she was scared to say how she felt and I think it comes back to me going, I always have just wanted to fit in and be accepted in life. And I realized that all the plays I write have got a theme of acceptance. And I think that's a huge thing to do with how you talk about mental health. We need to try and accept ourselves to then be able to open up conversations. And from that, one of the main things is why we don't do that is is because we've got a fear a fear of being laughed at a fear of what people will say a fear of what the media might say sometimes even a fear more closely of what your friends and family might say and often it's easier to talk to a stranger and often in the plays i write which are all inspired by true events and true people it's that thing I sometimes get people to talk to strangers in the play as opposed to talking to their friends and family. But then that's a good discussion point to talk about as audience members to go, why did they not talk to their family? Because they're scared that there's a stigma and whether that is to do with mental health um, or whether that's to do with um, something that they're scared to talk about, an illness, um, something like some of the, the different projects I've done is I've been really lucky to have worked with some fantastic organisations like the Scottish Cot Death Trust, who commissioned me to write a play about a couple who had lost a child and the stigma that was attached to that, how they were ignored, the effect it had on their mental health. Um, and that was a full length play, but I went out and did lots of research and questioned people um, who had experienced this. Um, and also um, I did a project with Waverly Care in Edinburgh, in, yeah, in Edinburgh um, about the stigma attached to H, H, I was say HMV, not HMV, HIV, that was a slip of the tongue. Um, um, and again, I spoke to people who had experienced, lived experience of living with HIV and AIDS, especially during the time of the 80s and 90s and the stigma that was still attached and the effect it had on the mental health. And um, currently I am working um, off the back of a, a Paisley 2021 20, culture project um, to let the voices of Fergus Lee Park and Paisley heard because there's a stigma attached to mental health problems there because they have been told in 2012 and 2016 that they are the poverty black spot of Scotland and the UK is the worst place to live and you know you don't work and um, you have drug problems you have drink problems there's no education so I'm working with them to uh, currently writing a program a, a play but I'm talking to them about what it is that the truth is the voice behind the picture what really goes on and that's with all the plays I write there's numerous things I've done over the years but the key thing for me is is that when I talk to these people to try and get the stories sometimes I write the work sometimes I get other people to write the work but the key thing is is that these people do not feel exposed they don't feel that they are talking about their life necessary necessarily what is the buffer that is there and that buffer is is that you get them to create a character 
you give them questions about their character, you get them to think about a setting, a place, um, experiences, memories. I do lots of breakfast. I do lots of short workshops um, uh, to get people inspired like that and pose questions. But what people are doing from a mental health point of view is they're writing about themselves. And I say, use yourself as the tool. You know, that's how I work as a writer. So anyone, whether they are, you know, a professional writer or someone who's a community writer or someone who's starting out, I think everyone is a writer and it gives them a chance to express themselves in a very, a very clear way but in a very safe environment but something that can start a discussion and something that gets their voice out there without going hi this is me telling my story they are able to create this character they can deviate a little bit from it if they want to but the core essence is using the self so how do you use yourself as the tool whether it is writing whether it is you know visual art um, and it's really important that that's there and it's a way to go, here, here we are. And this is the story that, you know, that I want to tell. Um, so for me, it's about creating a safe environment for people to talk about stigma. And I bet everybody here has a fear about something that they don't want to talk about. And if we all work together to create, you know, some short plays and I got you to write, say, a monologue, you know, I could get you to write about that fear without you realising it. Um, I'm not saying that I'm getting into your minds, <laughs> but it's that way of like, you know, playing with it to get you to talk about something you wouldn't. And I would never, ever then say to you, well, what part of that is true? I always remember working um, in, uh, I, work, I work a lot with young people as well sometimes, uh, between the ages of kind of 16 and 25. And I remember I did a lot of work out in North Lanarkshire and West Lothian, and we created a lot of uh, films um, where I went in and got young people to create characters. And then we filmed these, I then wrote the script around that for them and then some professional actors. And I always remember one girl, she was about 16, she opened up about how her best friend had died in her arms through alcohol. Now she did this through character, but she then came to me and said, I've been scared to talk about that because I've always blamed myself and that's had an effect on my mental health. And that story's always stuck with me because she was scared of the stigma that was attached to everything with that. But she didn't have to say that. But what happens is a lot of people have opened up to me. I know that Maeve and I, um, on the project, I'm just about to talk about the voice behind the picture that we did over lockdown, which was I worked with 14 writers, um, all on Zoom, live and recorded sessions. I'm one of these people that when things happen, how do we find solutions to keep things going? So we created a community of 14 writers who got some live sessions um, about how to create characters, um, how to link into memories, how to find their voice, to write a monologue about the stigma that is attached to something in mental health in their own lives. And we, the, the 14 monologues, which you can still watch, um, on our uh, YouTube channel and that as well, are, are, are brilliant. They allowed the writers to express themselves. Some of the things that came up were about the situation when people were in lockdown. Some of them weren't. Some of them were about loss. Some of them were about um, death. Some of them were about loneliness. Um, there was such a broad range of things that people talked about that they may never have talked about, health anxieties, that were affecting their mental health that they thought had a stigma, but were able to write about it in the form of a character. Um, and they were guided through all of these workshops. But one of the people that, that really stuck out, who then kind of opened up to me as well, um, and I know he's happy for me to talk about it, was a guy, Grant, who had uh, lost twins to a miscarriage. Now, he thought there was, as a man, there was a stigma attached to being able to talk about, you know, how he would feel at losing children. He had to be, in an old fashioned term, the man, you know, who was, uh, you know, together, who couldn't cry. But he wrote one of the most beautiful pieces um, that let him express his feelings, the way that he felt about the world without feeling judged. Um, and it's one of, it's, he'd never written anything before in his life as well. And I think that's what's fascinating. I, we can get such great pieces out of people who have never done anything before, because we want to also install through the way that I work, confidence in people so that they feel empowered. So yeah, I often work with professional writers, but some of the writing I love is when people have 
done very little writing because we're getting raw lived experiences. Often I say to some professional writers, I'm like, get out of your bedroom and stop just writing in your room. Get out and see the world. And I think that's what with the voice behind the picture, the monologues that were created were so beautiful because there was such a richness of the world that people were able to talk. But also what that did was you're creating something. And then back to what Abby was saying about, you know, the audience, they weren't making it for the audience. They were writing it. But then the audience were able to have discussions about pieces. And then maybe we don't know these for fact, this for a fact, but people then at home can be talking about the characters and things that have happened to that character who had health anxiety, who had just lost a child. And that can open up discussions as well for your audiences. And then that can open up a, a bigger conversation for Q&A sessions, or these pieces can then be taken, as Maeve and I have been talking about, you know, can these pieces be taken into workplaces, you know, places that don't normally have a chance to talk about things and um, to be able to take whether that's you know in the times that we can do this a theatrical production you know so they have the live experience or whether at the moment it is these recorded monologues these recorded experiences but one of the key things is as well is the process the safety that people feel when they are writing and I know I've said this a couple of times but they don't feel exposed that they feel safe and also that we have fun with it as well I think that that's something that's really important and we're bringing communities together and I think the more that we bring communities together in art the more we feel less isolated as well because people in life now are becoming more and more isolated as well because of a mediatized culture you know especially just now because of current the, the, the way the world is with health and even before that I've been thinking how do we keep people connected in art and writing and everything that's involved with that allows us to have a shared experience to be together um, and to express ourselves in that way and um, what um, the current project that um, Maeve and I and Simi are currently working on as well which has um, come off the back of the voice behind the picture is um, now called hidden a new one called hidden women and Maeve had been approached by some of the volunteers who are engaged with CME and who are in their 50s to go, we feel like we're really under, underrepresented, you know, what goes on in our lives. There's kind of stigma attached to who we are. People don't know what's really going on, um, you know, by the wider population or, or, or women in their 50s feeling ignored. So. Um, Maeve contacted me and we, we chatted about it and we've got 10 women in their 50s who most of them have never written anything in their life before and I got an email yesterday going Lisa I'm terrified about this after a few sessions and I'm like it's okay we're going to get there and what we're doing again is they're getting some live and recorded sessions to create characters to to tell a monologue about a woman a story in their 50s what the truth is they're not telling confessional theatre, they're not doing a, a confessional piece. They distance themselves by then creating this character, this monologue. They can create a cultural world, you know, that's uh, different from theirs. But the essence is the truth and how you use yourself. Because it's like if you watch a, a TV programme, if you read a book and you or you go to the theatre and you really connect with something sometimes that's because it's come from a place of truth and it's how we try to find that within people so that we're expressing that so clearly and that's how we connect our brains are all wired in different ways and what one person likes here someone else might not like but sometimes the more truthful it is the more we connect with it and that's why I think it's so important to be able to discuss mental health so that we don't have stigmas attached to it and we're getting a truth out there and the groups I've been working with as well don't want this to stop and this is the problem that often happens so many groups I've worked with all over Scotland for the past 10 years they go we want this to continue and then it stops because there's no funding and I know I can see probably people nodding and it happens over and over again and that actually then has a detrimental effect on people's mental health 
because it's like we've just been given something and now it's been taken away from us. So what are the ways, and I know it's something that, you know, Maeve and I have talked about and that we will maybe be in some of the discussion groups, how can we keep things continuing? How can we keep creatives together? And I use the word creatives, not just as people who are professionally trained, I'm talking about people who work in all walks of life because everyone is creative it's like we're creative every day in life whatever we choose to do even down to what we cook you know it's like what is that creativity how can that be exposed to allow us to talk about mental health and for us not to feel scared and that's the key key thing is how do we not feel scared about what we want to talk about how do we get that voice over there the main inspiration for the voice behind the picture, which was the first set of monologues was, and which has then come from Hidden Women, is why do we hide behind images now? Images on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat. People are portraying something in life because they're scared to say what they need to say. And through this way of working um, through workshop methods, um, through uh, the pride of having somebody else read your work gives people a, a sense of, of purpose and an openness to be able to talk about their mental health. And I think for me, it's a really beautiful thing because what we are doing, just to finish up just now, is we are making people visible and everyone deserves to be visible and to have their voice heard as well. I could talk, as Maeve says, I'll know, I could talk for hours and hours. And uh, there's so many things that I haven't talked about and I'm, this is really as succinct as I can make it. Um, so um, I am open to any questions, queries, comments and things later as well. But uh, yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lisa. Another wonderful input. Um, again, so much in there. Um, I noticed that there's a question coming through around the idea of safe spaces and making people safe um, after Abby's um, talk. Um, and, I, and I wonder if um, part of what Lisa has spoken about there in the way of the, the process by which she has um, taken the voice behind the picture and hidden women forward maybe and like one answer um to that um in the way that um the protection of the participants on on lisa's projects uh, is, is such an important part of that of that process um while still honoring the lived experience and the authenticity of of the kind of voice behind those the monologues that that have been created um, and i just want to say a huge thank you to lisa for everything that she has done um, with those projects her absolute passion and boundless energy um have just been such a pleasure and um have really created some i think some wonderful wonderful projects and also i want to say a thank you and a hello to some of the writers that i see be there, Leah, waving. I'm sure there's a couple of people who are involved in the, the first uh, cohort of uh, the voice behind the picture um, who created some absolutely wonderful monologues. And you, as Lisa said, you can still go back and watch the voice behind the picture monologues at the In Motion YouTube channel, um, which I was about to put a link to, but I realized I had not done that yet. So I'll do that in one second. I should have perhaps introduced them as a package, um, but I forgot to. So I'll just separately introduce Joe Finley from Mental Health Foundation, who I think is going to then say a couple of words about evaluating that project. i am just hand over to Joe just now. Thanks. Thanks, Maeve. Um, hi, Ari, for time, just so I know that um, what to skip. I mean, but absolutely technically, you have one minute. Excellent, so good, why right. you perhaps two or three <laughs> Thanks, <minutes. Lisa>. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll not, I'll, I'll just, I'll be very brief. Um, really, the interesting part was the, the, the part that Lisa, Lisa just described um, in terms of the project itself. Um, my role with uh, the Mental Health Foundation is I am a research manager and the, the, the primary part of my role is to work with CME in partnership to um, evaluate and provide research supports to the various different initiatives that um, CME provides across settings and of course one of those is social movement and as such I became involved in the, this particular 
piece of work that Lisa talked about, uh, the voice behind the picture, which um, was a great piece of work to be involved in as an evaluator because, um, you know, every now and again, something really, really interesting and different comes along. And this is one of those one of those pieces of work. So it's been a total privilege to, to, to be involved. Um, so that's just a wee bit about myself. Um, that's probably enough about that. Um, the, the evaluation itself was, was, was quite short and sharp um, to reflect the, the, deliv the delivery of the programme itself. Obviously, it was, um, it was very much in response to the pandemic. Uh, we conducted an audience survey um, to capture some views from people who, who watched the screening, watched the monologues. Um, as part of the, the Traverse Theatres online programme and also then as part of SMAF's programme of, of work. Uh, so we ran an audience survey, we also did some um, qualitative data collection, so I obviously had an, a, a, a discussion with Lisa herself and a focus group with the writers who were involved in the, in the project. So that was all really fascinating. I am still pulling this together in a report. There has been some delays along the way, but it, it is in the pipeline and that is coming soon. Um, but I can share with you really briefly um, uh, some of the findings from the audience survey, if that's helpful just now. Just some high level findings that I've picked out at the moment. Um, and as we're talking about audiences today, I thought it would be more appropriate to, to look at that side of things. Um, so in terms of the, the, the audience evaluation, it was attached to the, the event page um, and we got, uh, I, I'm trying to think now how many responses we got, I think it was around about 13, um, and which is actually quite good for just putting a survey on a website um, and having no real captive audience for that. So, so we were pleased with that. Um, some real quick stats from the findings were that in terms of those people who attended the online screening, 50% were male and 50% were female. Um, over half of audience members, so 54% of audience members, uh, reported that they had lived ex experience of a mental health um, problem. So that tells us something about the people who uh, were attracted to the screening and something about the people who are, who are engaging in this type of um, content and, and work. Most audience members or the, the significant uh, minority, 46% said that they'd found out about the screening through a, 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 someone involved in the project, the project participant, but others had found out through social media or through a friend or community organisation. Um, again, the majority of audience members, 85%, said that they attended the event because of A, their interest in theatre, but also because of an interest in mental health. So it was the combination of the two that really attracted people and that really brought people to, to the screening and to the monologues, which was a really positive finding. Um, also, um, just under two thirds of uh, respondents said that um, they, yes, they, they, they came along because of their personal interest in mental health, either for, 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 from their own experience or from the experience of someone close to them. Uh, but finally then, um, over half the audience, well maybe not quite finally, sorry me if I'll, I'll, I'll hurry up, uh, over half of, of audience members, 54% said that watching the monologues had made them feel differently about mental health. And a couple of quotes um, that I pulled out from that um, illustrate that. So someone said just how much more pervasive an issue it is, how some people still hide it and feel the need to hide it. Um, and another person reported, it's opened my eyes to more complex recovery journeys. Over three quarters of audience members, 77%, reported that the event would, would and did encourage discussion about mental health. So that was a really great finding. Um, and a couple of quotes to illustrate that then um, are the, the wide diversity of stories are so powerful and have a strong peer-led recovery strategies. It got my family and I talking about it lots after we watched it. My teenage children and husband said it helped them understand some of my black dog days better. I hope so. It's been it's good to be able to point people towards feelings I've had. So it really, really did touch people. And it was, a, you know, obviously a really powerful experience for people who took part and for people who watched it. And um, so that came through really strongly from from the, the survey. Some final things then, 31% of audience members said that watching the monologues had inspired them to do or to change something in relation to their or others' mental health. The majority of people who attended said that they would attend a similar event in the future. And the most important aspects or the things that would engage them the most were hearing stories of lived experience and um, experiencing that um, theatrical experience combined with 
uh, a focus on mental health. So others who said they would also attend a similar event in the future to get the opportunity to, to connect with people, albeit online, um, and again, if the event had a focus on mental health. So some quick but really positive findings in terms of what, we, uh, what has come out of the evaluation so far. Again, the report will be available in the next few weeks um, and we'll pull all of that evidence together. But for now, some, some, some really good food for thought and some really good points to think about. And I'll, I'll hand you back if that's... Any questions, of course, I'm happy to answer at this stage if I can. Thank you so much, Joe. I'm sorry that we did squeeze you out there with your with your time, um, but that's not to say it's not really um, important stuff. And I think it really highlights the the importance of the evaluation process in in how we fit all this work together and how we look at what are the themes coming out and are the theories that we have about what engages audiences and what really connects with people and what challenges stigma. Um, we need to be constantly obviously testing and evaluating that. And there's lots, lots more really specific pieces of evaluation that we can do looking at all of these um, ingredients that have been highlighted by Claire's research. Um, so obviously MHF are going to be a huge part of that going forward and I think perhaps for other people who might have similar projects that they're in, involved in and um, there might be some ideas there around the types of questions that you might want to be thinking about um, when you are sort of conducting your own evaluation or of course you might have some excellent evaluation methods that you're already using that we would love to love to know more about um, because it's always the, the trick, isn't it, to actually get that feedback from people who, who have um, come along and, and attended events. Right, Theo, I think, um, once again, wielding my power, um, I think we'll move straight now into um, hearing from our final contributor today, um, Andrew Eaton-Lewis, who is the Arts Lead for SMAF. Um, to sort of focus a little bit for our last, not even really half quarter, um, on maybe some ideas that we might want to take forward for the future and a sort of platform for br bringing together all the work that we're looking at and some of the ideas that we've spoken already about today and ways that we might do that and also ways that you guys um, might be able to help to influence how we develop those ideas ideas and, and share your thoughts around that and then as promised we will break out again for a breakout session that can that can continue a previous conversation and add in some of this new information as well but I promise we will be done by 12 30 um, though I suspect we might need to have a follow-up a follow-up event for people who are interested in taking this this forward so I feel like all of the beginnings of discussions are not going to get concluded today. So I should probably stop talking and hand over to Angie. Thanks, Angie. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Andrew. I'm the Arts Programme Officer for the Mental Health Foundation. Can everybody hear me okay? Excellent. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to talk too long because I'd rather kind of give the remaining time to other, other people contributing. I'm, I'm here to listen more than anything else. Um, but just a very quick introduction. Um, I'm part of the programming team for the Scottish Mental Health Arts Festival. Um, it's an annual festival around 300 events all over Scotland um, in May each year. Um, and uh, I found, found the, the research that's been talked about this morning actually very reassuring because um, a lot of the things that have been talked about are things that we've been trying to do for, for a long time, particularly um, around about lived experience. Lived experience is, a, is a, I find myself underlining that when, when the, the phrase came up. It's a, it's a phrase that's very much at the heart of what we've done for, for since the beginning, really. It's a, the festival has always been about trying to uh, kind of empower people to tell their own stories, their own mental health stories, and um, and and recognizing the power of that to to, to change perceptions um, uh, for audiences, but also for people themselves. Um, uh, and it's this self stigma is, is is a powerful thing, often as 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 the stigma um, uh, that other people um, uh, put on you. Um, so, um, but but. Even though we've been going for a long time, we're we're constantly trying to learn new things. We're constantly trying to learn how to do the festival better, how how to uh, 
um, try new projects, new ideas. And one of the ideas we have been exploring um, in, in dialogue with CME is the idea of an artist network um, or a mental health artist network. Um, one, th one thing I have observed um, in, in, in being part of the programming team over the past few years is that there is a noticeable increase in the amount of artistic work, um, quite high profile artistic work over the past four or five years in particular that is explicitly addressing mental health. Um, you see this, for example, at the Edinburgh Fringe, the, the Edinburgh Festival, um, where we, um, we, we started an award actually for, uh, four years ago uh, called the Mental Health Fringe Award in recognition of work that addresses mental health. And there's a lot more of it, um, uh, which, which is um, something to do with um, a reduction in stigma around some things, certainly about ang around things like anxiety, anxiety and depression. Um, but this obviously raises a lot of questions and a, a lot of things we need to be thinking about. Um, it raises questions about um, uh, best practice. I mean, how, how that, how the, are there ways of making that work which uh, is um, protects the people involved and also, a, and there are questions about what responsibility you have to an audience. Um, there are um, all kinds of, yeah, all, 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 all kinds of questions that are, are, are raised. The, the more this work is made, and the higher profile it, it has. Um, it, yeah, it, it, but it also presents opportunities. I mean, um, uh, opportunities for, for, for research, for, for, for peer support, um, for kind of sharing of knowledge. And um, so, so there's lots of different ideas that have come together to, to, that made us think that a mental health artist network um, bringing to get a, an opportunity to bring together a lot of the people who are making this kind of work um, in, in all the different ways that they're doing it would be an interesting idea to explore. And we're at very early stages of that. Um, and uh, part of that kind of early process is to just um, ask questions of, of people in, in, in groups like this about what would you think of that? Is this something that you might be interested in joining? And what form might something like this take? What would you want out of it? What, what um, um, yeah. So, uh, I think we're going to go into um, breakout rooms to kind of discuss this idea. And um, may maybe is there more that you'd like to say about um, uh, your, your thinking behind the artist network idea? Because it's very much come from CME as much as us. Yeah, thanks very much, Andrew. Um, I think for me, the artist network, network really does, every time that we sort of raise another idea about um, this is a really important aspect of how we create art that we hope will tackle mental health stigma. Um, for example, looking at what does lived experience involvement look like exactly as Andrew suggested? How is that um, done in a responsible, empowering way? Um, how do we um, understand best ways to create and facilitate discussions around artwork? Um, and what should those discussions look like? What can that look like online? How do we um, bring together artists, practitioners who, um, might want to come and make collaborative artwork with groups of people who experience lived experience, experience lived experience mental health problems. That's a clunky old sentence, isn't it? But I think at every turn, it feels like bringing together a really inclusive, supportive network of people who are engaged in all different ways in creating this type of artwork would be a fantastic space for us to work together to develop some perhaps guidance around, you know, best practice about what that might look like. Also to be able to sort of have that as a natural home to offer training opportunities to artists if there was an appetite for that. Um, a place that we can really focus evaluation. And I really hope going forward for organizations like See Me, a place that we can focus some, some actual resource, um, which is, you know, something that is often missing um, from the artistic work, I think, and these kinds of projects. Um, so I hope it would be an avenue that we could actually put some money into as well. Um, so I think there's, yeah, I think I feel like there's just kind of loads of opportunities um, with an idea like that. But, you know, I'm sure a lot of people here will have thoughts about what that might look like even if you do not feel like 
it would be a uh, you know I uh, you don't you're not necessarily an artist yourself I you don't envisage becoming part of the network as a member you might be thinking of ways that you could engage with such a network in you know your other capacities and so any way that you would like to influence our thinking on to how to set that up especially to make that as representative and inclusive a group of people as it could possibly be um we would obviously love to hear people's thoughts about how we take that forward as angie said it's it's in its really early stages of of discussion so the perfect time for you to tell us how to do it i think we could probably um, just spend a few minutes maybe feeding back or hearing some thoughts from each of the rooms and um, if there's somebody in each room who might be willing to do that um if we maybe just go through them in or numerical order. Lynn, could you tell us who the facilitator was in room number one with your special powers? That was me. That was you. Oh, do you know what? People probably know what room they were in. You guys know what <laughs> numbers are. Um, is Claire yeah, or someone in Claire's room feeding back? Yeah. I'm going um, do you want both sessions? Just go with your highlights. Go <laughs> with the highlights. I love it. Um, yeah, we had some really interesting conversations. Obviously, Zoom came out quite strongly because that's very much what we've all been using recently. Um, but just some really interesting things about, um, I think it was in the chat as well, about the barriers that it has taken away for a lot of people, a lot of people being able to engage that haven't necessarily been able to engage before. And actually, the, the amount of engagement through it has been really high. I heard from a couple of different projects which were saying, like it has really worked for them for a number of different reasons um but actually um the time it took like the fact that you had more time to be able to speak and open up um was really interesting and the fact that people could come on um without their cameras if they didn't necessarily feel that they could switch their cameras on but they still were able to have the space to talk about the issues that they wanted to and actually a, a number of people felt that that meant people were talking more in depth than they may well have in a in an open conversation and um, in the physical life um, so that was really interesting um, when we talked about the um, the network um, probably the highlight for me just interestingly is we were talking about how the word art in itself can create barriers um, with a lot of people um, from the groups that have experienced it before talking about that it's um, a word that people very much say oh that's that's not for me I've, I've never been a good at, like at creating stuff um, I've never been good enough I can't um, I can't do that so it's not for me and I think um, people with some people from the Murray Wellbeing Hub were talking about they use the words creativity instead and that had um, really helped people engage with the events. Um, talked a lot about uh, the quality of the art, um, which was a very interesting conversation. But realistically, what we're saying um, with this network and the ability to collaborate would hopefully reduce the need to be so competitive over funding, and that actually this could be more of a collaborative project projects going on and that um, within the network you'd be able to find all the skills that you needed for the types of projects you were looking for. Um, so yeah, found that really interesting and yeah, thanks for my group, it was a good discussion. Thanks Claire. Um, can room, somebody from room number two, would you like to give a quick feedback? If you know who you are. Were we room two? I'm not sure. Let's Sorry. Just um, I'll just go through them if you want me to. Breakout room two is Andrew's group. Um, three is Joe. Four is Lisa. Lisa. And five is yourself, Eve. Okay, Andrew then. Okay. Sorry. Yes. Um, yeah, we covered lots of different grounds. Um, uh, we talked about. Um, I, mean, I think we generally talked about the kind of things people might need from an artist network and the kind of uh, skills and context that would be useful. I mean, we talked about um, uh, the, the need for people who are kind of facilitating mental health 
discussions around arts to be um, to be uh, to be tra properly trained to do that, um, whether it be in mental health first aid training or, or, or that kind of thing. And um, it's it's important to know to be able to, uh, to to hold a space and how to kind of facilitate a discussion. Um, we talked about um, uh, responsibility to um, audiences um, in 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 making work that is exploring um, uh, trauma and 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 what and what I suppose what best practice there is uh, uh, around that, and also just a general kind of need for support and advice. Um, uh, on on making work for uh, addressing mental health. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Andrew is Joe next. Yeah. Um, so um, the our first discussion was quite brief. We 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 sort of took up all our time on very interesting introductions. Um, so we had a little bit of chat around one of the the points there around tackling stigma and discrimination. Um, and there were, there was a few. Uh, we got a chance to discuss discuss a few things. Um, in terms of um, expressing your stories through medium a medium that you 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 may not may not be overly familiar with or confident. Um, using but actually people pushing pushing their boundaries um, and also some people's experience of using um, art to challenge stigma and discrimination and perceptions of mental health particularly within the BAME community um, and how art actually made that an easier thing to do. In terms of the the artist network we all agreed that it sounds like a great idea there were again some concerns around technology um accessing using technology but probably more so um accessing that technology you know not having a, a phone that you can do that through or a laptop etc so we actually discussed some quite um practical solutions to that in terms of um digital access funding that was highlighted by someone in the group um, and local area programs that, that refurbish old phones and laptops and then donate those to, to more vulnerable groups. Um, so we had a bit of a, a chat around barriers and um, how maybe CME could support in providing resources around um, where to go to, you know, what's available, what funding's available, how, how to do these things on a more practical level. Um, and also there's the, the, the point that some people due to, due to a mental health condition may have access to technology, but actually don't want to, to use it and don't find it a, a, a good way to, to engage. Um, in terms of um, ideas about how CME can create an inclusive, supportive, innovative network, um, lots of great ideas. Um, it, the, the, there was a good point made actually that a lot of art related mental health Pro, pro, projects, um, that was not easy for me to say, already have, already build up their own networks around those those projects. So for example, um, the voice behind the picture created a really strong network just right, right there. So it might be worth thinking about how we tap into existing networks. Um, also, um, that the network should include uh, a really broad um, range of artistic artistic genres and um, so you know arts in, in any form at all and also people who maybe don't consider themselves as artists but actually are interested in what the benefits of, of engaging in art for for the for improving mental health can do so really being as thinking as broadly as possible around that and um, also building up a bank of contacts so people know who to contact for what and um, proper consultation and um, about what people actually want from from the network and sharing learning and um, obviously people are very interested in the learning that can be gained from being part of, of, of such a network and how that can benefit their own work and the work of others so that was really important and um, had a couple of thoughts on on projects that and ideas that people are taking forward at the moment i'll not go into them in huge detail there might be a way that we can capture those and um, at the end of, the, of this event and um, but for example, there, there is some work going on um, in Glasgow around using the arts to allow people um, to have a safe space to talk about their, their experiences of mental health barriers and solutions to, 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 to those. Um, and also a, a virtual concert, Lee, you might want to correct me on that, but a virtual concert um, that is being hosted uh, for young people in Murray to try to get a, a project more well known. So those are a few of the things that are, have been going on. And that was that sums up what we, we talked about. Thanks, Joe. Lisa. 
Yeah, I mean, I guess we were talking more just trying to get people to share who they are with each other um, and get to know about stuff, typically of me, because um, I've got a very people-centred approach to stuff, so we kind of deviated. But I thought that that was really nice because it, there were seven of us there, but it felt like we were getting to know each other and crossing over. And I think that's something which kind of we then highlighted going, if you're going to create a network that it isn't always a big thing like this that you've got to see like you know 50 faces do we have smaller groups you know that people go right this is your part of this group this week or you know at various times so that there's an actual point of being able to have conversations that don't just last in a breakout room um you know people can sign up for certain things if they want to and from that um, i used the example of when um when i was at the tron theater and we had the tron 100 which was an artistic membership for writers actors and directors and that was to stop isolation and to bring people together and um, so that their mental health was best and they could be creative and how we were able to share events that each of the people who were involved in that were doing. So say for example, um, let's take Hidden Women, which we are going to have on the 26th of November. We can tell the network of people we're working with at seven o'clock on the Beacon Arts Centre Facebook page. <laughs> but we can have, um, you know, people advertise that to everyone and go and afterwards there's a Q&A so that people feel part of that community and then um, if Kadea who I can't see her now but she's here she'd had a radio uh, piece that she was doing and um, that she'd worked on and something now being commissioned through the BBC from that oh, there you are um, going um, and I loved her ethic and just work kind of solutions thing I love I loved that just getting on with it but that she could then say we've got this and we may have a discussion about this so that we're sharing what each of us do and then naturally things can come together as well and so that we're not just we're not just seeing the person we're seeing some of the work that they do too and but then not everybody's doing work and as um i've still got it down as ewing i'm sorry because that's what my brain is still telling me um a lovely lady from uh, North Lanarkshire, where have you gone? Um, um, there you are. Um, yeah, how, you know, working as part of, you know, the NHS, they are, and, you know, in health improvement teams, how often they don't always get access to artists, to different things that are happening, and that if this network exists for people who are in, there's so many health partnerships all over Scotland, of course, that that can give them access and oh there's an artist in terms of you know drawing there's an artist in terms of theatre there's an artist in terms of film you know whatever that is um, and that can allow us and um, should said there as well you know it could account for then commissions or working partnerships because people don't always know who exists and may always use the same people who may not be producing necessarily the best work and I hate to say this but I've experienced it but sometimes people produce lazy work and you go you want people who have got the passion behind it all as well so it can open up the networks with not just focusing because I saw there was a bit of chat on the chat there as well it's not just about you know an elitist kind of thing here's the artist it's about everybody being equal together um, and coming into sharing whatever that is and I mean I think we would even be inter interested I've had experience in it but other artists may be interested in you know hearing from talks from people as well you know even from somebody who is in a health improvement team how do these things work well, you know, a lot of the time we talk about the art, but how does the Mori Wellbeing Hub work? How do these different things work so that you've got an insight into, yeah, the community, the, the, the ground, the people who are on the ground running? Because I think as I, I know more creatives who could, probably could be involved in this as well, but maybe there's a fear that they think, how do I fit? I don't fit into this. Um, so yeah, so share, sharing things, having a way of going, is there something like, uh, let's just say once a month, that there is specific days that events are happening, whether they're talks, whether they're different things that everybody doesn't have to come to, but there's the opportunity and that people are constantly being told, you know, um, well, if you want to come to this, you know, if you're interested and we're building up a big net network that people can feel they can drop in and out of. But if there's a a way of being able to send information out that isn't too like filled with you know too dense that people still feel part of something because sometimes just even getting an email to go oh I feel part of that 
And I think Facebook pages are a really good way of doing that as well. So I think maybe a Facebook page or something that helps with that, that people may feel they can interact with. And just one last thing on the digital side, I totally agree with what Joe had said there because there's the digital fund um, and it is all about uh, how do we make sure that people have got access. And I've come across that recently and I've managed to get hold of various tablets and different things for people who didn't have that. And I think that's really important that we're not kind of discriminating and eliminating people from it um, and that something that Katie had brought up as well was about they'd had an accessibility fund laid aside in their projects and I think that's something that people may need to now start to look at that there's a digital access fund available for you know finding a, a reconditioned iPhone or um, you can buy like you know um, uh, internet things that you could send to somebody to give them so much internet as um, they'd said as well so that people are feeling memory you know what I mean I used to use them on the USB stuff that you can use so that yeah if you've got that that people aren't feeling that they're totally um, excluded from it as well um, and that's it just now <laughs> Thanks, Lisa. Um, we're officially out of time, so I've officially broken my promise. So um, I won. Our conversation um, was absolutely fascinating as well, and lots of good advice and thoughts. Um, the one thing that I will share just from our room, I think, um, to end on is the fact that it's so great that we are so early in this process because everybody can have a voice in in how we actually put this network together as we're as we're sort of seeing and so i think that is the key thing that as we sort of bring together the group of people who are going to take forward creating the network that's where we want to see like the the sort of biggest possible diversity of, of voices represented in actually creating it um, and not bring in our diverse voices after we've already decided what everything is going to be. Um, so I think it seems like there is so much um, enthusiasm for this idea. I really appreciate all the contributions um, that everybody has made today, both the people who have spoken and given inputs and um, to everybody else as well. Um, I think there's lots of different pieces of work, the Artist Network, of course, um, but perhaps other things that we can take forward on the back of this. Um, so I think it would be perhaps if um, myself and the people who um, helped put this event together, if we step back, think about what the next steps might be in terms of bringing people back together again. I think that the kind of need and desire for um, a meeting that is more about networking and more about just people being able to, as Lisa said, connect as, as people and um, to kind of explain some of the, the things that they're involved in is something that kind of came out pretty loud and clear from um, some of the earlier conversations that we had and maybe came up for you guys as, as well. So um, I will be in touch with um, you all trying to pull together everything from this. I'm going to ask um, the facilitators to also perhaps share um, some of the, the thoughts that came out of the room to, to include in that. We will also, of course, be sharing um, Claire's research paper um, as soon as that is ready to, to, to go out publicly as well. Um, but if you have any, obviously, if you have any thoughts about what our next step should be in terms of perhaps another event, another meeting or anything else, um, I think everybody has my email address because um, I've been handing you guys with emails as well about this event. So um, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. And just in general, I am open for business for any and all conversations about arts and mental health so if anybody has would like to talk more about project that you're involved in or anything else then please just drop me an email and we'll put some time in the diary and um, i'd be absolutely delighted to do that